promise of the Savior for power from above. A wondrous gift that's given for confidence and mission. Holy Spirit, you make all things new. Strangely dim 
in the light of his glory and grace turn your eyes to the hillside where justice and Good morning if you're on holiday at home. Whoever you are and wherever you're watching, it's great to have you with us this morning. My name's Johnny, I'm the pastor of the Village Church and I'll be leading our service this morning. There'll be other people involved too with singing, praying and Bible reading and then a little bit later Ben Jones, a member of the Village Church, will be preaching to us and we're really looking forward to that. But as we start this morning, I'm going to read Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is probably the most well-known psalm in the Bible. You'll have heard it before, maybe many, many, many times. But there's a reason Psalm 23 is the most well-known psalm in the Bible. It's a beautiful psalm. And through its beauty, Psalm 23 strengthens people like us. It speaks of a shepherd of the Lord himself, 
A shepherd who loves his sheep and whose love will follow his sheep all the days of their lives. And so as we start, let me read Psalm 23. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely your love will follow me all the days of my life. If the Lord is your shepherd, if you're one of his sheep, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ this morning, the Lord always has and the Lord always will love you. He loves you today, however you're feeling. And he loves you today, whatever you've done. And his love will lead you. His love will lead you until you dwell or until you live with him in his heavenly home. His love will follow us all the days of our lives. His love endures forever. And that's what we're going to sing about in our first song. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us as a shepherd is with his sheep. And so we're going to sing. We're going to sing a song called Give Thanks to the Lord. We're then going to listen to another version of Psalm 23. And we're then going to sing a song called There is an Everlasting Kindness. Let's sing together. Thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and now stretched arm, His love endures
is strong forever God is with us forever This is Sally Lloyd-Jones reading from the Jesus Storybook Bible, a paraphrase of Psalm 23. God is my shepherd, and I am his little lamb. He feeds me, he guides me, he looks after me, I have everything I need. Inside, my heart is very quiet, as quiet as lying still in soft green grass, in a meadow, by a little stream. Even when I walk through the dark, scary, lonely places, I won't be afraid, because my shepherd knows where I am. He is here with me. He keeps me safe. He rescues me. He makes me strong and brave. He is getting wonderful things ready for me, especially for me, everything I ever dreamed of. He fills my heart so full of happiness, I can't hold it all inside. Wherever I go, I know, God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love will go too.
Kids, did you know the Bible says 400 times that people like us are like sheep? And did you know sheep aren't clever animals, sheep are stupid animals. For example, sometimes sheep just fall over and can't get up again. And sometimes sheep are really stupid. They wander away and get lost and get stuck and they can't get home again. And the Bible says we're all a bit like that, especially when it comes to God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And you may have gone astray this week. You probably have if you're anything like me. You may have ignored God or rejected God and you may have done that on purpose. But when we realise that's what we've done, it's right to say sorry. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to say sorry to God, to the God who loves us. And so I'm going to pray what's called a prayer of confession. And if you agree with this prayer, at the end you can say Amen. And so let's pray together. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the schemes and desires of our own hearts and have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done. And we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who repent according to the promises declared to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In Isaiah 53 verse 6 it says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. That's us, that describes me and that describes you. But then Isaiah 53 verse 6 says this, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the him there is Jesus. Iniquity is another word for sin, and we deserve to die for our sin, but Jesus died for our sin in our place. That's what the verse says, the Lord laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And all of us who have said sorry to him are forgiven in full, and that's because Jesus died for us, and that's amazing. That's what we celebrate as a church together. And kids, in a moment, we're going to listen to a song that will help us remember this wonderful verse, Isaiah 53, verse 6. After we've listened to this song, we'll pray. We'll then sing again. We'll then read the Bible and then Ben will preach to us. But before that, let's listen to this verse, Isaiah 53, verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray, ba ba do ba ba. Each of us has turned to his own way, ba ba do ba ba. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sing ba ba do ba ba. Isaiah 53 6. We all like sheep have gone astray, ba ba do ba ba. Each of us has turned to his own way, ba ba do ba ba. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of our soul. Sing ba ba do ba ba. Isaiah 53 6. <coughs> Alright, it's your turn now. We all like sheep have gone astray. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we are humbled by the words we have just sung together, for our hearts recognise how we are just like silly sheep that are prone to wander and head in the way we think best. Father, just as sheep are useless without a shepherd, we acknowledge together this morning that so are we. Without a shepherd lovingly leading, we get lost, head into trouble, and life is hopeless. Father, we praise you for your steadfast love and kindness that you have lavished on us. Thank you that you are the God who pursues, brings back and restores such silly sheep. We praise you for sending Jesus, our great shepherd, and bringing such hope. Thank you, Jesus, that because you were oppressed, despised, rejected and killed, we can know freedom from our sin-ridden hearts and experience forgiveness and know life to the full. We pray for your world. Father, in your mercy, help the people of Beirut. Bring comfort to those who mourn, healing to those who are injured, shelter to those who are homeless, food to those who are hungry, sleep to those who are experiencing mental distress. Equip your church to reach out with compassion and love and bring the hope of the gospel to such tragedy. Bring political stability to Lebanon. Please permit corruption and mismanagement to cease. Father, where there is hostility towards your people, turmoil and intense suffering, where nobody knows what will happen next in a world infected with coronavirus, and where trials seem too great to bear, we pray that your church would know protection, care and physical provision. We pray for each other. We rejoice that Jesus bore our griefs, carried our sorrows, and because he was crushed, we have peace with you. Father, please may this truth penetrate our hearts today and affect the day-to-day -day of our living. May those of us who are anxious and afraid experience help and peace from Jesus. Comfort the lonely, we pray you would surround them with your love and presence. For those sick, disappointed and experiencing painful, difficult circumstances and trials among us, Help them find rest in you as their place, their difficulties, hardships and responsibilities of life onto your shoulders, knowing that you have promised to gently lead and carry in your loving arms. For our young people receiving exam results over the next couple of weeks, please calm any nerves. Father, help them to trust you and bless their hard work and efforts, we ask. We pray they would know guidance for the next stage of their lives and it would be a smooth transition. Thank you for Ben, his reliance on you and for the words you have given him to speak to us this morning. Father, please take away all distractions and help us have ears that listen and open hearts that respond to you. May your word teach, rebuke, correct and train us in righteousness so that together as Village Church, we may be used for your good purposes. We praise you for your amazing grace to us and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Our reading today is from Luke 16 verses 1 to 13. So Luke 16 verses 1 to 13. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So we called in each of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 3,000 litres of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 1,500. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? 30 tons of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 24. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Thank you, Gemma, for that reading. And good morning, everyone. Let me add my welcome to you. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm a member here at the Village Church. And if we were to gather together in the school hall this morning, you'd probably recognise me running around after my two children. And whilst we might feel bound during this time of church, uh, during lockdown, we read in the Bible that God's word is unbound. And it's great to be able to continue reading through our series together in Luke this morning. But I must confess, this morning's parable is not easy reading. And personally, Jesus' words have landed a blow to my own life. And so... I really need God's help in preaching this passage this morning, so let's just take a moment to pray together. Lord, we ask for your help this morning in understanding this parable. We pray, Lord, you'd make the hidden things seen to us and would open the eyes of our heart to humbly receive your word and allow it to land deep down in our souls and transform our lives for the glory of your one and only Son, Jesus. Amen. The M word. It's never been more important to talk about money. That is one of the latest advertisement campaigns you might have seen on TV recently from Lloyds Bank. And from our passage this morning, it would seem that Jesus agrees with this statement. 
In fact, money was one of Jesus' favourite topics. He talked about it more than heaven, more than hell, and of all his parables, almost a third of them were on the topic of money. Last week, we saw the destructive power of money in how it took hold of two brothers' lives over their inheritance. Both brothers allowed their desire for money to ruin their relationship with their father. And in our passage this morning, Jesus leaves us with two hard-hitting questions. Where will you invest your money? And who do you really serve? And he helps us answer these two questions with a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So let's dive into this parable and uncover for ourselves its hidden treasure. We're in Luke chapter 16, and in verse 1, the first observation we make is that Jesus is speaking to his disciples, believers. And he tells them the story of a wealthy man who had what we might call today a wealth manager, like a financial advisor to manage his wealth and possessions. And this rich man hears that this manager is wasting all his possessions. So he calls him in and he gives him the sack. And so what will this manager do? Well, as we read on, he completely disobeys his boss's orders to turn him in his management of the account as he goes out and hastily commits fraud in an effort to safeguard his future. And if you look down in verse five, as the plot unfolds, he calls in his master's debtors and he writes off some whomping discounts for them. Now picture the scene as this manager hastily makes some calls. Uh, hello, can I speak to uh, Filippo Berrio of Premium Olive Oils? Yes, yes, it's quite urgent. Ah, Filippo, my man, how are you? I hear business as well. You're flying off the shelves in Waitrose. Now, Filippo, listen. I know that last order with the boss was a big one and you were in debt 3,000 litres of olive oil. But Filippo, me and you go way back and I'm feeling generous today. I want you to prosper, so how about I write off 50% for you? Let's call it 1,500 litres. How does that sound? Now, Filippo, just one thing. Remember this act of kindness if I was ever to be a man in need. Now, can you believe the dishonesty in this manager? And he goes on. Verse 7, he calls in the next debtor and writes off another 20% of what he owes the master. And these were no small sums. It would have equated to 20 months worth of salary. And Jesus concludes this parable with the verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Now, I'm sure the disciples hearing this 200 years ago were just as shocked as we are hearing this today. Hang on a minute, Jesus. You what? Did you just say commended the dishonest manager? But let's look again at this verse closely. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. Now, Jesus didn't say the manager was commended for his dishonesty, but that he was commended because he acted shrewdly. Now, you may be thinking, well, it's the same thing, being shrewd and being dishonest, isn't it? Well, the word shrewd here is not to be confused as craftiness or slyness. The word shrewd here is the same word used of the wise man who built his house on the rock that withstood the storm in Matthew 7. So the manager is commended for his wisdom in safeguarding his future. But the question still stands, why did Jesus have to use a dishonest manager to make this point? Couldn't he have done the same with an honest manager? Well, there are a few things to say about this. Firstly, this is not the first time God uses a dishonest man to teach us an honest lesson. I suppose in many respects, that's the whole story of the Old Testament. God using dishonest people to teach us honest lessons. God even used the great King David in his dishonesty. 
And yet, I think the intent here is to shock us with this verse. We are to compare with the shrewd manager in his wise actions towards the future, but we are to contrast with the dishonesty of this manager. But if we think Jesus using a dishonest manager to teach us an honest lesson is a shock, then look out for the bigger shock that comes in verses 8 and 9. As Jesus hits us with a pretty hard rebuke, look back at me with verses 8 and 9. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, let's break that verse down. For the people of this world, that is, unbelievers, are more shrewd, more wise in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light, that is, believers. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That is, to use your money on this earth for things of eternal gain. Use your money on this earth to see souls saved for eternity. Because when earthly money is gone, when it fails, which it will, no amount of wealth protects us from death itself. All that counts then is what has been done for Christ, what has been spent for eternal gain. And that's a pretty hard message to hear from Jesus on a Sunday morning. Christian, the world around you is more wise in its dealings. They put more energy, effort and thinking into their business deals than you do in saving souls for eternity. And so, Jesus' first question for us this morning, Village Church, is this. Where will we invest our money and resources? Because when it comes down to it, we're all kingdom builders. We're either investing our money in our own little temporary perishable kingdoms on this earth or we're investing in God's eternal kingdom. And this is tough because we live in a world that is saturated by materialism. Millions and millions of pounds are spent each year to bombard us with the message, invest in your kingdom, store up treasure for yourself. You need it. You're worth it. Jesus speaks to our hearts and says to this self-saturated kingdom builder, don't buy the lie because it will not satisfy. And I preach this passage this morning, firstly to myself, with a heavy heart for all the times I have bought that lie. But I also praise God this morning that I'm a sinner saved by grace. And so I incline my heart all the more to listen to Jesus' warning. Don't buy the lie that this life is all there is. Be wise, village church. Be wise in where you invest. Now maybe God has used this lockdown to change your spending habits and you've been able to save more than normal. Will it enter your mind to think about how you could use that saving to invest in eternity? Maybe you're looking at your next car and rather than thinking how much more you could spend to get the next model up, you could think how much you could give away if you got the next model down. Maybe every time you buy yourself a book, you'll give one away to an unbeliever. Maybe you'll be generous in buying a Bible for someone for the first time. What a great way to spend your money. Maybe you'll go out of your way to generously host a great meal with the intent of connecting your Christian friends with non-believers. God has been very kind to us in all he's given us. The question we must answer is where will we invest it? Jesus' investment guidelines in verse 9 are very clear. They're black and white. There are two options when it comes to investments. Failed investments or eternal investments. Invest in your own kingdom, which has a short-term return, leading downhill to the grave, or invest in God's kingdom that lasts beyond the grave and into eternity. And Jesus' shock tactic in this parable, using a crook 
for us to compare and contrast to, force us to look at our lives against the wisdom and shrewdness of the dishonest manager in how he prepared for his future. How are you using God's gifts that he's given you to advance the kingdom? Now maybe you have to deploy business strategy in your job to help your business prosper. How could you use some of that business shrewdness to help God's kingdom grow? Maybe you're the most organised planner Bristol has ever seen. How could you use those talents to organise gospel events and opportunities? Let's not give the very best of ourselves in the workplace to prosper our own kingdoms and leave what little energy and efforts we have left to God on a Sunday. Let's be wiser in seeking the loss for eternity than we are in seeking our next job opportunity at work. Let's be like Lydia of Philippi, who we read of in Acts, using what God had given her, her house, as HQ for the gospel to reach her city. Let's be like the Joannas and Susannas of the church, who we read of a few chapters back in Luke uh, chapter 8, verses 1 to 3 who provided for Jesus and the disciples out of their own means as they went through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. So, where will you invest your money? Whose kingdom are you building? And this leads us on to our next question. Who do you really serve? Let's take a look again at verses 10 to 13. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, have you ever had this conversation with God? God, if you just give me that promotion, if I just earn that salary, oh God, then I'd be so much more generous in giving to the church. And it makes sense, right? If God would just give us a bit more, then we could give a bit more. Well, Jesus answer in verses 10 to 12, No, no you wouldn't. Look down again at verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Remember, it's not how much or how little we earn that prevents us from giving. It's our hard hearts. Two copper coins dropped in the giving box by a poor widow dispels that excuse for us. And this rebuke from Jesus is especially important to us as a church. As let's call it out, Emerson's Green in Bristol is a wealthy area and it's all too easy for us to conform to the pattern of our neighbours without giving it a second thought. And in verse 11 we see how money is God's test to reveal who we really serve. The true riches that Jesus talks of in verse 11, he's already explained to us in chapter 12 verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. True riches are not found on this earth, but in the kingdom of heaven. And notice how Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will follow. It's just as they say in the big Hollywood movies when they're trying to track down the gang leader of some serious organised crime. Follow the money trail. And the same is true of us. Once we've met our basic needs, whatever we plough our extra money into, that's what holds our heart's affection. The more you spend on your car, the more you'll love your car. You'll wash it often, you'll insure it, you'll secure it. The more you spend on your house, the more your house consumes your thought life, your planning, your energy, your research. And the more you give to missions, the more they'll consume your thought life, your prayer life, your time. The more you give to youth ministry, 
the more you'll love youth ministry and be concerned for it and our young people. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve both God and money. And in verse 13, Jesus calls us to take our stand. The battle is on. There are two masters demanding our service. One is master money. He's seductive. He's enticing. He promises us everything, but he under delivers and it will cost us our lives. The second master is the master of eternity, God, and he promis his promises are never empty. They're fulfilled in a great gift. It costs God everything to win our service. The blood of his son, who gives us immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. But you can't have both. Love of one leads to hatred of the other, and devotion to one leads to despising the other. Hard words from Jesus, but deep down do they ring true with you? Do you inwardly despise God and church stuff as it gets in the way of your plans sometimes? Well, the author of this book, Sex and Money, Empty Pleasures, Satisfying Grace, Paul David Tripp, writes this. In a very significant way, your life will be shaped by what you think about money. And in a way that is inescapable, somehow, some way, your heart will struggle with money. And so this morning, Jesus tells us to be like the dishonest manager. Think about the future. Make a plan for the future. Not a retirement plan that will only last until your funeral, but an internal investment plan that will never fail, spoil or die. In one million years from now, the wisdom that counts won't be how much you were able to save for yourself on earth, but how much you gave on earth to the gospel. And let's not miss here Jesus' message to us this morning in Luke. He's not saying if we're Christians, we can never enjoy the good gifts he's given us. No, not at all. All good gifts are from our Father in heaven. He loves us to enjoy what he's given us. The danger comes when we make those good things, God things. When they keep us up at night thinking about them. When we devote so much time and energy to them, we have nothing left to love and serve God, our family or our church. So we can make money a danger that will consume us or a blessing that will benefit friends for eternity. Now, the Swedish pop supergroup ABBA captured the danger of the desire for money in their hit song. Money, 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 always sunny in the rich man's world. All the things I could do if I had a little money. All the things I could do if I had. And this is man's age old problem since the beginning. Money can be just like a curse. Just like the serpent in the garden that first whispered into our ear, all you need is this and you'll be content. All you need is the Apple MacBook Pro 2020 bundle with the iPad and the AirPods and then you'll be content at university. All you need is the Tesla Model S and then you'll be content as an alpha male. After all, it's entirely electric, so you're helping the environment. And surely the more you spend, the safer it is. I've got to be safe for my family after all. I just need one thing to be happy forever at home. The Range Master Deluxe Nexus Steam Cooker. That's it. Then I'll be happy. All I need is the next holiday, the next house, the next extension. All I need and <laughs> boom. Jesus says, you fool. This very night, your life will be taken from you. And then who enjoys all the extras you've accumulated for yourself? Or money can be like the blessing of the most excellent Theophilus, who we read of in Luke chapter one, verses one to four. I imagine he used his wealth to great effect in paying Luke to write an orderly account of the events of Jesus' life and ministry 
the fruit of which is in our hands today, and thousands of years later is the most read book of all time, winning lost souls from death to life, from every tribe and tongue and nation. Now that is being shrewd. That is being wise. That is a winning investment. That's the investment that Jesus commends in this passage, one that wins friends for eternity. And wouldn't that be a wonderful way for us to use our wealth to fund an initiative like Theophilus did? Wouldn't it be a wise way for us to invest our money in one of our mission partners who's doing exactly that right now? A person who's sitting in a corner of this globe pouring out all the gifts God has given them to translate this life-saving good news into the native language of a people group that doesn't yet have it. Wouldn't that be money well spent? Money spent for eternal gain, a treasure stored up in heaven that no stock market crash, exchange rate drop or death itself could touch. The money we work so hard to earn, well, it's not ours anyway. It's only what God in his goodness has provisioned to us. And Jesus says here in verse 11, if we can't be trusted in spending it shrewdly, wisely, then how can we be trusted with true riches? And Jesus knows the vice-like grip money can hold over our lives. He knows the danger of how destructive it is. It can lead to a Christian squandering away their life on comfortable living while lost souls stumble towards eternal judgment. And that's why he spoke about it so much. He knows our hearts. We cannot serve both God and money. Now, I don't know about you, but this rebuke from Jesus hits me hard. Because if I'm being honest, I do enjoy nice things. I do spend too much money on stuff. I would be embarrassed to show you what I've spent on Amazon in the past months. I'd be devastated to sit down with God's accountant and, and follow the money to see how much I wasted on my own kingdom building compared to how much I invested in God's eternal kingdom building. And that's why I need to hear Jesus' words to me this morning. Ben, you cannot serve both God and money. Ben, be wise in how you invest in God's kingdom and not your own. You can't do both. Jesus reminds us in verse 9 that money and what it can buy on this earth will fail. Guaranteed it will fail you. It's a failed investment. And no wonder Jesus spoke about that so often, more than any other parable, because we need reminding of that every day. So, try this out as a little test. The next time you catch your heart desiring after the things of this world, call it out. Call out the failed investment. The next time you see someone smugly cruising down the motorway in your excessively expensive dream car, call it out to yourself. Failed investment. The next time you're enticed by that television advert for the all-indulgent, luxurious holiday, call it out. Failed investment. Or the next time you catch yourself in that dangerous, serpent-like conversation, oh, if only I had that then I'd be happy. Call out the failed investment and assess yourself against the dishonest manager. Ask yourself if you're making a wise investment, an eternal investment. Now, there are two ways we might respond to Jesus' words this morning. The first response is driven by guilt. Feeling guilty at Jesus, we reluctantly make a one-off generous financial gift towards the church or some gospel project. And for a while we'll feel good about that, whilst we slip back into our regular way of life. But that's not how Jesus wants his followers to respond. He doesn't need our money. He's the creator of everyone and everything, after all. No, he wants something much more than our money. He wants our hearts. He wants all of us. Not just the Sunday morning, once a week home group prayer here and there, subscription Christian that we can turn on, and turn off. No, he wants the 24-7 all-in Christian that is completely sold out for him. Jesus gave his all for us. He held nothing back. He invested everything. 
and he doesn't want to see a nice little financial appreciation on that investment. No, he wants to see a radical life transformation with that investment. We're saved by faith in God's grace and grace alone. We're not saved by our giving, but we are saved to give generously. And that's the second way we might respond to Jesus' words this morning. We let them continue to transform our lives. If we believe in eternity, it will change where we invest our money. We can't serve two masters. And what great joy it will be to be welcomed into heaven with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You didn't waste what I gave you in life. So let's pray that we'd let this word go to work in our lives today and transform us. Let's pray our desires would be to so set on the glory of eternity that it becomes our delight not to give begrudgingly, but to give cheerfully. Where will you invest? Who do you serve? Because it's never been more important to talk about money. The M-Word cam <clears throat> campaign gives three tips to talk about the uncomfortable topic of money. Listen, be honest and open, and seek support. And how much more are those tips for us when it comes to this passage? Let's listen to God as he speaks directly on the topic of money. Let's be honest and open to God about our struggles with money. And not just to God, but also to each other in our one-to-ones, with our home groups. Let's get the topic of money on the table and encourage each other in our greatest treasure, Jesus. And finally, let's, le let's seek support. Maybe a third response to this passage is the danger of doing nothing. What Jesus demands of us is, seems too unattainable. And you're right. In our own strength, it is unattainable. In many ways, I feel like an unbeliever when it comes to money. And so I cry out to God, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Money as our master will make us slaves. But the good news for you, church, is that our God is an almighty, sin-smashing slayer of slave masters. He conquered death itself. And so if you have any struggle with money, lay it before him in prayer and see him go to work in smashing it out of your life. Let's pray together now. Father in heaven, you, you know our hearts, Lord, and you know how uncomfortable we are to talk about this topic of money. You know how dangerous it is in our lives, Lord. And so we pray, Father, that we would lay it all before you now, Lord, all of our struggles, all of the dangers of money. And Father, we pray that you transform us, that you'd remind us of your son on the cross who paid it all for us, and that you'd remind us each day, Lord, that this life, that's not all there is. That if we believe in you, we're living for eternity. And we pray, Lord, that that truth, that promise, it would transform how we spend our money, Lord. That we would spend it for your glory, for the glory of your son, Jesus. I pray that in your name. Amen.
That's the end of our online service this morning. It's been great to have you with us. In a few minutes, we'll be on Zoom for some time to talk. On Tuesday evening, we'll be on Zoom for some time to pray. That will be between 8 and 9 o'clock in the evening. And then we'll be back here next Sunday morning at 10.30. And we'd love you to join us. But as we finish, let's pray one more time. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you're the King of Kings and we bow before you this morning. Thank you for your gentleness and for your friendship. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for your eternal love and for your faithfulness and truth. Thank you for buying us, for ransoming us and for bringing sinners like us near to your throne. Thank you. And Lord Jesus, please fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we'd be able to do what we've just sang. So that we'd be able to lay our all before you. And so that we'd be able to live to serve your majesty. Please help us to do that now and for the rest of today. And please help us to do that this coming week. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.